What's up? We back. We've got a great show for you today. My friend Benjamin Hardy. Benjamin Hardy's been the number one writer on Medium over the last two years. He's the author of one of my new favorite books, Willpower Doesn't Work, which we talk a lot about today. And I think you guys are going to get a ton out of this podcast. But first, we can't forget who brought you this podcast today. I want you guys to go tap into the wine that health leaders have come to love. Mark Sisson, Dave Asprey, Abel James, Rob Wolf, JJ Virgin, to name a few. If you love biohacking and you love wine, we finally have a Worlds Collide solution for you. The people at Dry Farm Wines are obsessed with mind, body, biohacking for optimal health and lifestyle. The cool thing is it was a natural extension for these guys who are healthy and hack everything else in their life to figure out how to optimize wine. Can't be done, you say? These guys make sure their wines meet the very specific criteria that people who are in the world of the brain and body and peak performance, i.e. me, love to know more about. All of their wines are scrutinized and investigated carefully to meet the exact specific standards that people like me want to bring out to you guys on the podcast. Specifically, they want their wine to be sugar and carb free. They want their wine to be toxin and mold free. The cool thing about this, guys, you can drink an entire bottle of wine, not be hung over the next day, and still stay in a state of ketosis. Don't believe me? Don't take my word for it. Here's what I want you guys to do. Head to dryfarmwines.com forward slash success 101 to learn more about the nutrition, the scientific standards behind this wine, and why you need to have a case of this showing up on your front doorstep. Here's the cool thing. For Success 101 podcast listeners, you guys are going to get one of the bottles of wine in your order for just a penny. You get seven bottles of wine, and one of those costs just a penny. Why? Because you can't give alcohol away for free, so they do the next best thing and give it to you for an Abraham Lincoln. This wine is amazing. I had some at home last night with my family. It tastes so pure, so clean. You guys know I don't bring anything to this podcast that I don't believe in wholeheartedly, 100%, and I was so excited to partner with Dry Farm Wines to bring this out to you guys. Again, head to dryfarmwines.com forward slash success 101. Grab your penny bottle of wine. Get this on your doorstep. And I think you guys are going to be blown away just as I was. Someone who had studied wine for a long time thought I knew a lot about the wine industry. Now I know about wine. Clean wine, naked wine, fresh wine, no additives. You're going to be blown away. If wine is your go-to in the evening or early afternoon, what are we going to do for breakfast? That's where my friends over at Ample come in. This show is also brought to you by Ample, which is my go-to brain and body peak performance day starter. There's nothing that gets me fueled faster. It's soy-free, gluten-free, non-GMO, no artificial sweeteners, no artificial flavors. They even have a keto version out now, which is amazing. Just this morning, I kid you not, I'm not saying this just for the podcast, I promise you. My kids were hanging all over me. I needed to get out the door and I grabbed an ample. I filled it up with water. I was out the door and on my drive in, I had 400 calories of some of the most select ingredients in the world. Healthy fats, quality proteins, probiotics, fiber and prebiotics, plant-based micronutrients, and a whole host of other things that you have to get your hands on. Just head to success101podcast.com forward slash ample. That's A-M-P-L-E. You're going to get 15% off your order. And what the great people over at Ample have created, I know you guys are going to love. Again, the ingredients in this thing are amazing. They're choice ingredients from all over the world that you can't get at your local supermarket. Even if you did, you'd have to take the time to blend, chop, measure. Who wants that? Get out of here. Just throw some water in it just like I did this morning, just like I do every morning, and head straight out the door. Again, that's success101podcast.com forward slash Ample. And you guys are going to love how your mornings start out. Lastly, guys, my team is still giving away my book, From Success to Significance, The Six Vision Building Strategies, The Five Components for Creating a Bigger Vision. We're giving away the ebook version for free all over the world. All you have to do is head to success101podcast.com forward slash book, select the ebook version, and at checkout, Enter free success 101. Again, that's free success 101. You're going to get an instant download to the ebook version, no matter where you are in the world, for absolutely free. Again, that's success101podcast.com forward slash book. Select the ebook version and enter free success 101. If you'd like to get the paperback version in the United States for a discounted cost, just select the paperback version, enter success 101 at checkout, you'll get the actual hard copy, which I like because I like to mark things up 
This thing's written out like a workbook, so you can make a lot of notes in it. So either the ebook version or the paperback version, your choice, go grab it today. Also, my coaching programs are still available over on the website at success101podcast.com forward slash coaching. Go check it out. Now, as I mentioned, we've got my friend Benjamin Hardy, who I've been a huge fan of over the last couple of years. And it's not hard to see why. He's been the number one writer on Medium for the last two years. His articles are phenomenal. I wondered when he was going to have his own book out, and here it is. I'm holding it in my hand now. Willpower doesn't work. You guys know that I love the study of the brain and how it works, or sometimes how it doesn't work. Studying that is the only way you're going to reach higher levels of peak performance. Willpower doesn't work really just breaks the mold on how we think about willpower, the stick to of work, and how we're going to reach higher levels of performance. We go into an awesome discussion today about the noise, the chaos around us. It's just gravity. It's pulling us back to where launching out, striking out on our own, doing everything that we need to do to get to higher levels of performance is very hard to do because of that gravity. We also talk about behavior and environment. I couldn't wait to get into our conversation today. So without any further delay, welcome Benjamin Hardy to the show new concepts and ideas to help you reach your full potential. Reach your full potential. Reach your full potential. Small win, small win, small win. Keep your momentum going. The Success 101 Podcast. Welcome to the Success 101 Podcast. This is your host, Jared Warren. At each episode, my goal is to bring you a new concept or idea to help you maximize your full potential. Thanks for joining me here today. Now let's kick things off. One of the things that you say is if you're relying on willpower to lose weight, achieve more at work, improve relationships, any of those sort of things, you are doomed to fail. Now, I think a lot of people would read that and go, okay, why is that? Why, if we're relying on willpower, which I think in this crazy, chaotic, fast-paced world, we have been told that our willpower is everything. Why did you dedicate your work to this? And why are we doomed to fail if that's what we're relying on? Willpower is obviously a very popular topic. It's a very commonsensical answer. But when you actually study psychology from a lot of different angles, you realize a lot of a different story. So When I first started writing this book, I actually was approaching it initially from the subject of addiction. I'd studied a lot of books on addiction because one of the things I I thought about is how can I connect something to something that's obviously important? So like when I'm writing a book about behavior change, I could study what the self-help gurus are saying, or I could go and study what the addiction experts are saying. And in this case, you know, I wanted to actually study what the addiction experts are saying because to help someone actually overcome an addiction is the real deal. Like that is behavior change at the extreme end of the spectrum. And when you study the extreme in a lot of ways, you can, you can find answers to even you know, some of the more simple stuff. And if you study addiction, you'll find over and over that the advice is very clear. You, know, you absolutely cannot overcome an addiction through willpower. And I, I provided a quote or two from addiction experts in the book about how a lot of people think that what the expert, or a lot of people think that what the addict needs is more willpower but nothing could be further from the truth. Can we camp out on that for just a moment? Because I know there's people out there from all areas of life that are dealing with addictions. They're dealing with, uh, you know, big and small. I remember reading that part in your book about it not being about willpower. I'd, I have to say I haven't dealt with a lot of addiction as far as like coaching people through that or personally myself in life. But I think you're right. I think that's what everybody says is, oh, they've got a problem. They just need to be stronger. Oh, they're burnout. They need to be stronger. Oh, they're fatigued. They need to be stronger specifically to people who are addicted or burnout or fatigue, why why does the willpower concept not work? And why are we taught to chase after that so often in our world today? So we're taught to chase after it because it's a really simplistic answer. You know, it's like, it, 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 it's, it's surface level. It's a very surface level description. Yeah, if, if they're not doing good in life, they must not be working hard enough. But addiction is not a surface level thing. It's something that's very deep in a person's soul. It's a product of, you know, traumatic experiences that have not been resolved. And so addiction, it's an adaptation to environment, but it's it's also an adaptation to pain. And it's trying to solve a problem. When people are saying you need more willpower, they're talking about the surface and they're not looking at the root of the issue. The root of the issue 
is that there's unresolved internal conflict and there's also a conflict in the environment. You know, the environment is supporting their addiction. Rather than trying to gut your way through it, you have to actually admit that you can't do it on your own. So Joe Polish, he's one of my mentors. He's the founder of Genius Network, but he's also the founder of Genius Recovery. He says that a person is as sick as their secrets. Uh, when you think about addiction, it's a very isolated thing. It's a very hidden thing. You keep it private. So addiction is disconnected from the other areas of your life. And what's interesting is that traumatic experiences are also stored in a person's memory different than normal memories. So traumatic memories are disconnected from the other areas of the mind. And they don't integrate new experiences in. So the memory is actually something that's fluid. It's something that should continually be changing based on new information, new experiences. Memories should always be changing as you change as a person because your memory is basically your filter to the world. But when you have a traumatic experience, your memories don't integrate new experiences. They become isolated and stuck and frozen. And so what happens is, is a person becomes frozen in their personality uh, until they can resolve that you know, internal conflict. And, and the only way to do that is actually through help from outside sources, through outside people, through new environments. If you're trying to gut your way, you know, this is what Joe Paula should say, is, is if you're trying to gut your way through an addiction, you're probably actually going to be forcing the addiction down even further. Uh, it's, it's really like what Albert Einstein said. You know, he said you can't solve a problem with the same level of thinking or the same level of intelligence that got you there. The only way out of an addiction is actually to admit that you can't do it on your own, to go into a supportive environment, to get people to help you, to get accountability, you know, to create, to, to actually get into a harmonious environment that supports you and have people who support you out of your addiction. One of the other interesting components of all of this is that one of the reasons people stay in addiction is because they actually fear the unknown. Like the addiction has become the known. They know what to anticipate. And, you know, personality, who a person is, is something that's very predictable. And when it comes to an addiction, and it could be to anything, honestly, you know, you could be addicted to your daily behaviors. You could be addicted to your job. You know, you're addicted to your life. Basically, people are addicted to what's predictable. Our brain wants things to be predictable. We want to know what to anticipate. The brain's, you know, one of the brain's core jobs is, is to be able to predict behavior. And one of the reasons why an addict stays in an addiction is because it's, it's safe. It's known to them. Even if it's horrible, even if they know it's destroying their life and killing their body and ruining their relationships, and they will stay in it because at least to them, they can predict it. And the foundation of all fears is the fear of the unknown because the unknown is uncertain. And if you step into uncertainty, then you cause an enormous wave of emotions to go through your body and your brain that you're not used to and your body has become addicted to emotion to certain key emotions and so you know that's one of the big things is, is that it's it's scary for people to do something that's unpredictable because they can't control the outcome well you just went there a moment ago and i was trying to figure out how am i going to tie addiction into people's lack of taking action because i don't dare want to hear someone who is in an addiction state or who's come out of an addiction state hear me talk about business or hear me talk about taking action on anything in life and think, oh man, how dare he compare those two things? But you just said it. I'll have to go back and listen to the recording after this, but you said something about... I can say it because <laughs> I connect the things all the time. You know, to Right. Me. Something about not taking action is similar to addiction. And I was going to ask, isn't being, whether it's being lazy or whether it's being fearful or whether it's whatever in my world, in the business world, the financial planning world, people don't take action all the time as entrepreneurs, and then they try to figure out why their business is not growing. To me, that's a form of addiction as well. Really quickly, before I even jump into this, I want to just share a concept of creativity and innovation. So when you really study how creative breakthroughs happen, it's primarily based on connecting two seemingly disconnected things together and finding a unique new aha, new angle. And really, that's what we're doing here is we're connecting how people can get out of addiction versus how people can make, take more action in business. And when you really drill down to kind of the fundamentals, you'll notice that there's an enormous amount of crossover. The same strategies and, and things that someone would need to get out of an addiction, of the, you know, are very much the same strategies that someone would need to really take their life to the next level in business. Because really what you're doing is you're changing, you know, I mean, that's what we're talking about here is, is how do you make fundamental, powerful changes in the direction that you want to go? Right. I know Marshall Goldsmith, you've got a quote by him in your book that says, if we don't create and control our environment, our environment creates and controls us. And you just pointed a few sentences ago back to addiction being controlled or being 
somehow manipulated, influenced by the environment. I know my answer for this. I'm huge on environment, but I'd love to hear from you. How important is the environment in controlling what we do, whether it be addictions or just lack of action in business? And you can tie that back to willpower in your book, right? But more importantly, maybe what we don't do. And then we'll get into the two different types of optimal environments you talk about. But how important in your research has the concept of environment been in controlling what we do or don't do? And how much of that really controls us more than we realize? Yeah, I'll just start with like a little example. So let's just look at women in society. And let's compare women in society today versus women in society 150 years ago. Is there a difference? Oh, yeah, definitely. What's the difference? Well, where do you start? I mean, first of all, there's more working women. There's a different culture shift as far as how women view work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's pretty much it. Is all I'm saying is, is you know, if you look at if you look at the um, like statistics, I think like 65% of people who get bachelor's degrees are women. You know what I mean? Like just women are just destroying it in business, graduate school. 65%. Yeah, wow. way more women are getting graduate degrees than men at this point. Like I'm think like an enormous amount higher. Women are just are just succeeding in society differently. And I guess a question if you looked at it at the surface level, you could ask yourself, you know, what's the difference? Were women just docile um back then or or has the cultural norms shifted? You know, when you really study behavioral organizational behavior or behavioral economics, there's a really good book actually. It's called The Fifth Discipline by an MIT professor. He's a behavioral and organizational behavior guy. But basically, he said that it does not matter how much energy and effort you put into changing behavior if the underlying culture conflicts with that. That's what we're talking about here with environment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, like the culture or the tone of the environment. So every environment has an agenda, every environment has and energy. Every environment has rules and norms. So you could be break that down around break that some down a people, bit further. For example, that, the that norms statement. in the environment are to be a certain way. You know, it could be watch TV. It could be. I mean, really, it's just there is norms in every environment, and and those things which we cannot see are actually very influential to how we think, how we act. And so basically the idea is, is what you can do in one environment, what you can do in one situation is very different from what you can do in a different environment and in a different situation. And this is really what drove the idea home for me, actually. My wife and I, while I was writing that book, I was actually a foster parent of three kids. You know, we've actually gone on to adopt those kids. But in 2015, my wife and I, while I was in the first year of my PhD program, we became the foster parents of three kids. And we brought the, you know, what happens when you take three kids from a very neglectful environment where they're not taken to school, you know, they're all staying in the same, living in the same room, you know, eating, you know, very unnutritious food. And there's just, there's no responsibility, accountability, no, you know, neglect, you know, highly neglectful parents. What, what happens when you take kids from that environment and you put them into an environment where, you know, there's affluence, where there's opportunity, where there's, you know friends nearby where there's support from, you know, teachers and, you know, where they have extracurricular activities. I mean, it's so basically what I'm saying is, and I'm trying to just break this down for people so they can actually understand the power of environment is, is what was possible, what was possible for my children and their parents had they remained in that situation is very different from what became available to them when they shifted to a new environment. And obviously, these kids are kids, and so they weren't necessarily responsible for the shift in environment, um, but their potential was still constrained by their environment, by what was around them, by the opportunities, because ultimately, a person cannot make choices if they don't have options. So women in society 150 years ago had less options, therefore, they had less choices to make. And so my kids, in their case, they had less options. They didn't have the option to, uh, you know, go play on a sports team because they didn't have a, you know, like a parent with a car who could take them. Every environment has different options and choices. And as an adult, depending on your goals, you have to decide, well, what environment is going to allow me the greatest opportunity to succeed? So in the book, what I talk about is, is that no one has the same amount of free will. Our free will is based on our environment. And this is something I learned in psychology, but rather than calling it free will, I actually call it contextual agency. Conte- your, your agency is based on the context in which you're in. And uh, there's a really, really good book 
from Ellen Langer. She's a Harvard psychologist. She's written so much work. But one of her quotes that I put in the book, and it's a quote that I just live by, is she said, social psychologists argue that who we are at any one time is based on the context we are in. But who creates the context? The more mindful we become, the more we realize that we can create the contexts we are in. And when we create the context, we realize that we have the power to change. And so the idea is who you are and what you can do is based on your situation, but it's your power and it's your responsibility to change your situation. And when you change your context, then you can change yourself. I love how you said that. It's your power and your responsibility to change your situation. Going back to your foster children, you just mentioned that they couldn't change their environment, but because their environment changed, now they're able to have more options. They're able to do more things. What about the person out there who feels, I mean, let's, I don't know how I'm going to describe this, but I know what's in my mind here. What about the person who feels like they're stuck? They feel like they've tried other avenues. They've had some hardships that maybe they created. Maybe it's their own doing. Maybe it's just their lot in life so far that they just, they haven't had a good, good lot in life and they need to, you know, figure out how to dig out of that. But they literally feel like your children who are children and they can't change that environment or feel like they can't change that environment. What would you say to that person who says, hey, I, you know, I'd love to change my environment, but I just can't. Or for sake of this podcast, they feel like they can't. How do you speak to that type of person? Where do they start? How do they change their mindset? Absolutely. Zig Ziglar has a really great quote. He said, your input shapes your outlook. Your outlook shapes your output and your output determines your success in life. You have to look at your input. Garbage in, garbage out. Step one, you're a biological system. So what are the inputs going in? There's information going in. There's food going in. There's probably other chemicals going in. What are the things that are going into your body that are literally becoming you? Because who you are is a product of what's going in. And so I think step one, you know, and this is really mindfulness 101, is just awareness of what's going on. You got to stop. In other words, the, you know, the easiest place to start is actually to stop the damage. What, what a lot of people say when you're trying to get into, like, like, let's just say someone's morbidly obese or even just very overweight, you know, the first step is actually not to go to the gym. Like the first step before you're going to start trying to take any steps forward is actually to top, stop taking so many steps backwards. The first step is actually to delete negative behaviors. That's far more productive than trying to add positive ones. Delete the negativity because it's taking up so much space. And so like, you know, there's the most common, simple, easy advice that you'll see in a lot of books like this, books like Essentialism and things like that, is literally to start with your closet. Like literally go in there and delete a lot of the clothes that you've never used in a long time. So like what I'm talking about here now is actually cleaning out your environment. Start to just remove stuff. And, act, you know, and in Tim Ferriss, but many other people have said this, you know, a cluttered mind is in a lot of ways a reflection of a cluttered environment. So like if you're looking at your environment, looking around your environment right now, and if, if it's pretty cluttered, there's a good chance that you're having a hard time focusing. And so if you want to change your focus, you've got to actually clean up that external environment, clean out your car, throw away the garbage, uh, throw away a lot of clothes you don't use anymore. Take, you know, take a bunch of stuff to the goodwill. You know what I mean? Like actually get rid of a bunch of stuff that's just noise because all of that stuff is energy in your environment. And that energy is costing you mentally, emotionally, interestingly as well. Um, all of the stuff in your environment is tied to your emotions because of memories. If there's stuff in your environment that keeps triggering you back to your past, old pictures, for example, of just times and places where you maybe weren't who you wanted to be or if you're trying to evolve beyond that stage, a lot of it's kind of like getting rid of a lot of the stuff that's holding you back. But a lot of it doesn't have to be highly emotionally charged. A lot of it's just getting rid of excess baggage and noise. In the book, I talk a lot about Newton's third law of motion. You know, so with every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Just think about any rocket launching into space. A rocket launching into outer space is literally exerting an enormous amount of effort to get from one environment to another. But once it gets into outer space, it does not take energy to fly. Like most of the energy is actually launching. Uh, once the ship is in space, it doesn't have to use very much fuel. 
And what that represents is, is when you're in an environment where you actually can live in congruence in an alignment, like if you're living in an environment where your values match the environment, it's like flying in outer space. It doesn't take very much fuel. But getting into that environment requires removing a lot of the baggage because if you've got a lot of weight that you're trying to carry with you into the next environment or into the next stage or chapter in your life, it's going to be really heavy. So your job is actually to delete and remove a lot of the baggage so that lift off is a lot easier. That's, that's, that's where I would tell people to start. Like that's, that's actually the only place you're going to start. You got to remove all the stuff that's keeping you weighed down gravity. In other words, all the stuff, all the physical stuff, remove the load because the lighter the load, the less intense the launch. And you know, the launch will be there. It's going to be hard because you're stepping emotionally into a new situation, a new identity, a new set of behaviors. And going back to the addiction concepts earlier, when you step into new, you step into unpredictability, you step into uncertainty. And there's, that's where the fear is. And that's why the gravity is going to be so hard pulling you back is because you can predict your current environment. You can predict your current situation. You can predict your current behavior. Even if you hate it, even if it's disappointing to you, at least it's known to you. And, and it takes a lot of courage to try something new, to step into a new environment, to step into a new role and identity and to try new behaviors and to surround yourself with new people. That's the launch is, is being willing to do that. And you can get to the point where you do that regularly, where you actually seek it, where you are, you can't help yourself from jumping from one, from one next you know, opportunity to the next because you're excited about the growth and you're comfortable in the unknown. So psychologists call that tolerance for ambiguity, where you're comfortable, you have a tolerance for ambiguity, you have a tolerance for uncertainty. And that's required for success in today's ever-changing world. Your book, as I mentioned, is titled Willpower Doesn't Work. And you've got a part in your book where basically it says, let's face it, you've tried, you've come back to zero many times over and over again and again. You find yourself falling short of goals time and time again, but you assume the issue is because you don't have what it takes. And that's exactly what you're talking about. People assume they don't have what it takes. They don't understand, in my opinion, the weight of what they're dealing with. They don't understand that rocket ship trying to get out of the environment, how much fuel and emotion it really takes. And so what they assume is that it's all them, but that assessment is all wrong. Your book, though, also talks about dreamers and doers. And what I've noticed before, and I've told this to several people, I've noticed there are way more dreamers than doers, people sitting around thinking about things versus taking action. But really, there's four types of people I've observed personally. There are dreamers and doers, but there are dreamers and not doers, people who procrastinate or people who want, they say they want a better life, but they don't move forward with anything. Then the third one is non-dreamers and doers. And then there are non-dreamers and non-doers, people that just really, you're like, man, what's your purpose to your life? If you had to pick one of those four, which one would you say is the most sabotaging? Because I think the world would point to the fact that non-dreamers and non-doers are the most sabotaging, but I would say it's the dreamers and the non-doers. Uh, it's a question you've pondered and reflected upon your, uh, your thought and your stuff has far more depth than my initial reaction. But yeah, I'd say my initial reaction, probably the two, whether you're a dreamer and non-doer or you're a doer and non-dreamer, there's a concept that I really like. It's basically, you know, you can have zeal without knowledge or you can have knowledge without zeal. And uh, there's a lot of people who have knowledge about something, but they have no zeal. Like, for example, they may like really believe in something, but they've got no zeal to like go and actually bring that vision forward, you know, like, and so there's obviously something missing with the vision. Um and then there's people who have a lot of zeal, but they have no knowledge. Um, so like these are people who, you know, they're, they're cr incredibly active and like even ambitious, but the things that they're doing are actually not helpful. Actually, they're hurtful to like the overlying vision or goal of, the, of whatever it may be, the organization or something like that. And so, yeah, I don't really know which one I think is worse. I think the idea is, is that you don't want to be in any of the other three categories. You want to be someone who has a vision and you also want to be an executor. Um, you want to be someone who, who can think big picture, but also can create concrete plans and execute on the day to day. Um, and that's a rare, rare, you know, uh, combination. Very few people do that. Do you think it's rare because people just aren't setting up their environment properly? 
Like in other words, they don't have the they don't have the lack of ability. It's it's not rare because people just can't do it. It's just rare because people aren't setting themselves up properly to ensure success. Yeah, I think I think that's a huge part of it. I mean, you know, one of the reasons I definitely don't think it's a lack of capability. You know, one of the core components of this book is a, a, an, a huge emphasis on nurture versus nature. You know, so willpower would look at people and say, oh, you just don't have enough in you. You know, that's that's looking at someone from a fixed mindset and saying, you know, you just, you really don't have that much potential. Like, you know, you just, you, you, you know, whereas, you know, a, a different approach where it's like, no, you actually could do better if you set things up differently. Uh, and it's your responsibility to set things up differently, to be proactive about what's coming in, what's going out. I mean, when it comes to setting and achieving goals, and that's kind of where this whole section actually came from in the book, I actually spent a lot of time researching the difference between wannabe entrepreneurs versus real entrepreneurs. And I was like, what the heck's the difference? Um, there's there's internal and external differences. So like a wannabe clearly does not see themselves as that thing. Like a wannabe entrepreneur does not identify as an entrepreneur. They see themselves as something different. You know, I'm not that thing, but I want to be. Whereas someone who actually is that thing says, this is who I am. And what, what allows for that shift? So that's the internal. And the internal and the external are very connected as I've talked about in this. So how do you actually make that leap? How do you make that shift so that internally you make that shift? And usually you do that, you do that through two things. You do that through behavior and you do that through environment. Um, those are, those are the vehicles of change. Um, and so, you know, one of the things I talk about in the book is, is like actually making financial investments in your goal, whatever that may be, whether it's, you know, to become a better tennis player, to be a success, you know, like actually invest forward towards what you're wanting to do what that does is it creates an enormous amount of commitment you know because in you know commitment follows investment commitment is a reaction and so when you invest in in goals capabilities relationships whatever it may be i mean even if it's just you want to get healthier and you invest in better food you know better information a gym membership like once you start putting your money in a certain area you begin to identify with that thing it changes your environment as well because you're putting maybe in this case new food in your environment you're you're surrounding yourself with new different types of people you may even be hiring a coach which is basically changing your environment you're surrounding yourself with someone who is you know in this case is in shape who's being paid to help you get in shape that's just one of the one of the ways in which you can go from being a dreamer to a doer is is what is it you really want to do start putting money towards that thing it was just such an awesome shift, paradigm shift, because so many things talk about chasing after willpower, the hustle, the grind, which really, Ben, I think so many people are going to get out, let's say 10 years from now, maybe not that long and realize like, man, this whole hustle and grind thing that we thought we were chasing, like nobody wants that. Who wants a hustle and grind? Like, let's make it easier, smarter. Let's live more around an essentialism or minimalism type lifestyle. Let's make it simple. Let's look at the one thing, the the wildly important goal and go after that and really change our environment. But when it comes to achieving goals and making committed decisions, you say in your book that it involves, there's five bullet points that I think are crucial for people to understand as we wrap up the show here. Number one is investing up front. Number two is making it public. Number three is setting a timeline. Four is installing several forms of feedback or accountability. And then five, which is what we've been talking about, which is removing or altering everything in your environment that opposes your commitment. Can we unpack maybe your top one or two of those as we wrap up here? Love all these things. One just quick thought, you know, as we're transitioning from your comment about the grind, grind, grind environment. Um, one of the things I talked about in the book is this idea of leverage. You know, so there's a quote from Archimedes where he says, Give me a lever long enough and a fulcrum on which to place it and I shall move the world. If you're trying to take a tire off a car, you've got a really crappy jack. I actually was recently in Utah and got a flat tire and like just the tools and stuff were really bad. And there was a guy in the parking lot and he had this huge pipe and he put it on like the, uh, and I'm, this shows how bad I am with like mechanical knowledge, but like, you know, he, he put, he put this huge pipe on the wrench and just easily twisted it off because it had so much leverage. It was easy. Like an example I give in the book, you could spend all the energy, all the effort, all the hustle, 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 all the grind trying to like 
from where we're currently sitting look at like some distant planet, let's just say Saturn. But with all the energy and effort, you could never do it. But if you use the telescope, you could easily see it, you know, and that's the difference. That's, that's rather than trying harder, it's actually just using the environment around you. It's actually using the tools, the lever, the leverage. What I'm just talking about here is, is using the tools that we're so lucky to have because we live in such an optimized, amazing environment. And rather than having these tools destroy us, let's actually use them for what they are because everything is easy. I mean, it's all been set up for us. It's been so set up for us to get the right information, to get the right help, the right uh, relationships. Everything is available right now. You know, we have the most amazing leverage right now. We've never had more options. We've never had more choices. And this is why willpower doesn't work, is because another definition of willpower is decision fatigue. And the more choices you have, there becomes this negative effect where you have too many choices and you experience what Barry Schwartz calls the paradox of choice. You know, you, you have too many decisions and you can't make any high quality ones. And so that's why you need to make powerful decisions to essentially cut off all of the noise from your environment. You've got to know your values. You've got to know what you want. And then you have to ultimately embrace FOMO. You've got to embrace, you got to just embrace missing out. That's because every decision requires that you have opportunity cost. So you choose an environment that shields you from most of the crap in the world. So you don't have to think about it, worry about it, and be confused by it. You just create an environment that allows you to be who you want to be. I think a lot of people are going to hear that and go, man, that sounds awesome. But when I wake up tomorrow, where do I start? And it's different for so many walks of life. I mean, for some people, they may be one millimeter away from a decision or changing that environment. For some people, they may be 10 degrees away from changing that environment. What would you say to the person, though? A similar question that we asked before, what would you say to the person that hears that and goes, man, that sounds awesome. I've got so far to go, though, in order to change where from where I am right now. Because a lot of times, what I'm getting at there is a lot of times we just get in our own way. We make things way too hard. Negative self-sabotage, mindset sabotage, all of that. And if you had a third-party bystander consultant looking at that, they'd go, oh, man, just change this, this, and this. Like, I can see it differently than you can, but you can't see it because you're there in the, in the frame of your life. What encouragement could you give people on changing tomorrow around that quote that you – around that phrase that you just made there when they feel like they're so far away from making that happen? What I like about you is, is obviously, you know, and you've mentioned in this podcast that you've, you've been – at or around rock bottom. And so why I like you, and I'm sure that why you, uh, you know, you probably have some loyal followers is because you can empathetically say, you know, there's people who are going to hear this message and they're going to immediately disregard it because as much as they know that it, you know, it sounds great, it would be amazing from where they're sitting, their life is just such a mess that they're in such a pit that there's probably no way that they can really dig themselves out of this one. It's just, it's, it's too bad. It's just, there's nothing they can do about it. And that's, is so true. You know, I mean, it's so true that that's how it feels when you're going backwards, when you've got negative momentum and when, when your life's a mess. So I'll, I'll definitely share what I think absolutely can and must be done. What's the, you know, aside from removing stuff from your environment, what's step one, you know what I mean? Um, and really what that is, 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 you 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 have to decide you have to make one positive decision is ultimately what you have to do you have to start with one good choice that's you can't you you can't make a thousand good choices without first taking one step um and the best way to make a great choice is just to tell yourself so you want your you know let's just start with tomorrow you know let today be what today is and and just start tomorrow. As weird as that sounds, because like that's like the worst advice ever is really to start tomorrow. But it, it, but in this case, I'm going to tell you, you actually do have to start tonight because you have to make what's called a cognitive commitment. You have to actually make a decision tonight about what you're going to do tomorrow morning. And the decision you're going to make tomorrow morning is, is that you're going to wake up at a certain time and you're actually going to do it. Uh, and that time is actually going to be a little earlier than you want. It doesn't have to be five in the morning, but I want you to give yourself at least 
15 minutes that you would not have given yourself. So if you make a decision, a commitment to wake up tomorrow morning, give yourself 15 extra minutes, here's what you want to do the night before. You want to decide what time you're going to wake up, set your alarm, put it on the opposite side of your room or in a separate room so that when you actually hear it go off, you have to get out of your bed and go get it. So that's called a forcing function. You've created an environment that forces you to do something something specific. When you get up, well, after you've actually set that alarm, put your phone on airplane mode and don't take it off airplane mode when you wake up. When you wake up, I want you to just take five or 10 minutes to think about what kind of person you want to be, what kind of things that you can do today to make even one step in the right direction. So this concept is called be, do, have. Basically, you have to first decide who you want to be. Then you decide from who you want to be what that person would do. So if you want to be a nicer person, well, then what would that nice person do given your current situation? And if you do those things, then you will have something different. Be, then do, then have. If you give yourself even 10 or 15 minutes, it could be in the form of a meditation. It can be in the form of a prayer. It can be in the form of writing down in your journal, which is what I would recommend. You just write down and just think about who do I really want to be? What kind of life do I want to have? And this is called living with intention. This is called being proactive versus being reactive because most people, as soon as they wake up, they react to their environment and they get sucked back in and then they go through the same cycles that they've gone through in the past. That's not what you want to do if you want to change your life. You want to wake up and if you actually did wake up when you told yourself to, you've actually given yourself more momentum and confidence because you've actually done what you said you would do. So you got a little bit of confidence and momentum because confidence is a byproduct of, of behavior. So if you behaved correctly once, there's a little confidence. That's a little momentum. And your motivation is actually what follows your behavior as well. So if you start just getting small wins first thing in the morning, those ripple, those ripple into better experiences, better decisions later in the day. But especially if you give yourself some space, give yourself some space first thing in the morning, decide what you want to be, maybe write down two or three things that you can do. You know, they could just be, I'm going to write a nice note to my spouse, or I'm going to say something nice. I'm going to give a compliment. Who do you want to be? And this is how fast you can shift your environment is is you just start operating from that higher place. You start acting differently. Here again is the fear. If you start acting differently, it's going to be unpredictable. It's going to, you're, you're not actually sure what the outcomes would be because how you've been acting for so long is now the norm. It's the prediction. You can predict it even if you hate your life. And so be, then do, then have. Give yourself 15 minutes. This is like the essence of a morning routine. This is just deciding who you want to be and then acting from that place and knowing, let's just say you've had a negative cycle for a really long time and the relationships are mostly really strained and negative. It may not go off really well. And you may reach a lot of friction. You may experience a lot of negativity um, because what you're doing is is you're basically disrupting your environment. You're disrupting the people around you, but that's what you must do. You must be different to create a different situation. And the principle is powerful. Be, then, do, then, have. You want to just decide who you are, who you want to be, the life you want to have. The more, you know, immersive the experience, the better. The more you can visualize, experience the emotions. Gratitude, for example, just changes your life. So maybe spend time in the morning visualizing and experiencing gratitude for future success. Really feel what it would feel like to really make the changes and feel grateful for those changes as if they've already happened. And then just live out from that perspective. Behave differently. Behave from that place. And you start doing that consistently enough, you'll have you'll start having more confidence. Confidence motivation they're all just about consistency they're all about small wins and so if you can start tomorrow with getting up when you say you will not getting sucked back into your phone giving yourself a little time to meditate being intentional and then acting a little better all of a sudden you'll start to believe that it's possible and then you'll start to move forward and you'll start to make shifts So that's really where you got to start. Thanks so much for your time here today. I know we scratched the surface on so much of your research and so much that I've read. I would encourage all of you guys to go over to medium.com and check out Ben's writings under Benjamin Hardy and check out the book, Willpower Doesn't Work. I mean, it's endorsed by Ryan Holiday, Ariana Huffington, Adam Grant, Jeff Goins, Joe Polish. Tell us where we can steer more traffic your way. Find out more about you and your writings. Yeah, just go to benjaminhardy.com. You'll be able to get access, obviously, to my best articles. You'll be able to 
sign up if you want for the newsletter. You'll get a free Peak State checklist. And really, that's just it, you know. And there's obviously this podcast. And yeah, just you can just find my writing at BenjaminHarry.com. Guys, I hope you love Ben's message today on how we can all get to higher levels of peak performance and how willpower just doesn't work. If you guys would like to connect directly with me, please shoot my team an email to info at success101podcast.com or catch me in the world of social media on Instagram under the name Jared Warren Consulting, on Facebook under the name Jared Warren, and I'll catch you guys on the next awesome episode. Until then. <laughs>